Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of One Mic Night, the podcast that brings you stories of artists and people on their journey, helping to guide, answer questions, and motivate you in life and the business. My name is Marcos Luis, and I want to thank you guys all for joining me for this episode. I'm really, really excited. But before we do that, make sure you like this episode and make sure you get ready to share. And I want to thank all the people who come into the live chat every Thursday when the episode drops so we can talk about the episode as it goes on. My guest today, I'm very, very excited. She is a breast cancer survivor and she is a breast cancer awareness activist, among many things. Please welcome Melissa De Valle Ortiz thank to you, One Mike Night. How are you? I'm excited. I'm very excited. You have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> it's funny how things happen. We just like things just happen and then they happen. So here Literally. we are. <laughs> Literally. Listen, I have questions. The first question is, who is Melissa? Who is Melissa De Valle Ortiz? Who is Melissa? Um... The first thing I always tell people is um, I'm a mom, you know, um, I have two kids and they're grown adults. I'm embarrassed to admit, but that's me, number one, first and foremost. And um, I'm from Brooklyn, Puerto Rican, my whole life, live in Bushwick, Canarsie, Clinton Hills. And landed in Sunset Park. I've been here for the last 25 years. I love um, that. Yeah. Mom is important. It's important to start off with mom because mom plays a pivotal role in everybody's life. My mom and I are like this. Yeah. So being a mom is definitely number one. Thanks. Um, I want to talk about who you are in terms of uh, where you are right now. Okay. So you are a breast cancer survivor. Can you tell us a little bit about how it all, how you found out and where this journey all began for you? Sure. Um, so funny, you know, I, I always brag that I don't get sick and I haven't been sick since 1997. I made a prayer to God and I asked him to please never let me be so sick that I need anybody's help with respect to my children. And um, I just, you know, I, I, I had 102 fever. I was sick to my stomach. I couldn't take care of myself. And I had to let my little kids, six and seven, go to school around the corner by themselves. And I was mm. so stressed about it. And I prayed and I said, you know, just give me that. When my hand to God, I never got sick. Never, nothing more than allergies never had after that i never had a fever i've never had a thing so never no reason to go to the doctor i'm okay next thing i knew we we're in the middle of a pandemic i'm okay and then i caught this crazy eye infection january 2020 that would not go away two three months later came back again. Two, three months later, came back again. So I'm home for a year because we were working from home. And then they called us back to go back to work. Um, the eye infection uh, came the whole month, the whole year of 2020. I caught COVID February, 2020. And then um, they called us back to work May of 2021. And they said, oh, you're going to have to get the vaccine. And I said, um, let me just make sure I don't have any underlying conditions because I've been skating this whole time except for this, this eye jammy. And um, went to the doctor. They were like, yeah, clean bill of health. You're good. You could get the vaccine. But uh, you turned 50 in 2020. So let's get your mammogram too. And when we scheduled the mammogram, that's when we found it. So ironically... While everyone else, COVID took a lot of lives, COVID actually saved my life. Wow. That's yeah. a beautiful way to look at it. Yeah. COVID was a really hard time and we did lose a lot of people. But I always say this almost in every episode, there are a lot of good things that came out of it. For sure. I'm not saying that cancer was a good thing, but knowing that you had something to take care of it 
like you said, it saved your life. Let me tell you, um, I, I always had this, this little egg in the back of my head, right? When I was 12, I had a dream with my grandfather that I was sitting on the radiator in Bushwick, sitting on his radiator because he owned the house. And he was staring out the window and uh, looking onto Bushwick Avenue. And I said, Papi, why the radiator's on? And he didn't answer me because it was hot. It was the summertime in the dream. And so I reached into my blouse to wipe all the sweat that had been building up. And when I went like this, a big ball of ice came out. Hmm. What do kids do when they have a melting ice in their hand? They suck on it, right? right. Yeah. So in the dream, I started sucking on it. And it tasted like, like it didn't taste like anything, but it had the consistency of hair gel. And I was like, oh, this isn't ice. What is this? And when I looked at it, the ball was all white. I was like, oh, that's cancer in my dream. Really? At 12. Wow. So fast forward, when the doctor said mammogram, that came back. Are you serious? Wow. I was, that's what I was going to ask you, it, you know, like growing up, well, we know disproportionately women of color, specifically black women. Um, and they say non Hispanic white women actually have the highest rates of right. breast cancer. But growing up, did you think that, you know, was that, I was going to ask you, did you think that that was something that would happen? Or did you ever think about taking mammograms? Because a lot of women don't even think about it. Like women of color don't think about taking a mammogram unless your doctor forces you to. So here's the deal. So when when she said that, I had I had already had a mammogram when I was like 32 because I had remembered the dream and I had felt a lump. And so I insisted. My doctor was like, okay. And then I was like, ah, they they scanned it and they said, no, there's nothing there. Don't worry about it. You're fine. But we'll monitor it. But I was like, I don't get sick. So I don't need you to monitor it. So God already told me in my dream, just look out for it that that time. And I've, you know, I sound crazy, but I pay attention to my dreams. Anyway, as far as women not getting their mammogram, we, we tend to not. And the women that, sorry, it's one of the dog. And the women that tend to not get their mammogram are black and Latina women the most versus white women. And the reason why we have this more, more death rate due to breast cancer is because we wait so long. Absolutely. It's so far, it's so progressed that the level of care that they have to give to you and treatment to stop it from growing is tremendously invasive. Yes. I feel the best time to catch it is that is earlier. So I was blessed to catch it at stage one. Um, my treatment was not invasive at all. But when I tell you that it resonated with me, I had lost my friend in 2020, in July of 2020, to breast cancer. And um, she had been battling it for 20 years. And... Um, God bless her. You know, she, I even dedicated my, my mammogram to her, you know, cause it was almost a year to the day that she had passed away that I went to go get my mammogram. And then it was five days before her, her one year anniversary that I had to get my, uh, lumpectomy. So, you know, a lot of the things that I learned about taking care of myself came from her. Came from her. Wow. So when you found out, let us know, how did, how did you feel? What was going through your mind when you get the results? Um, so the first thing, the first thing that they, the first mistake they did was call me and tell me, you know, we, yes, the test came back positive. It's definitely um, breast cancer um, because the first thing that they do, right, is a mammogram. That's when they do the imaging to look to see what's there. Then they have you to come back a week later and they do what's called a biopsy. So they do an incision, they go into your breast and they take a little sample 
Now they're going to lie to you and tell you it's going to be a little pinch. <laughs> it really feels like a three-year-old just punched you in your tit. Oh, wow. I can't wow. lie. Wow. But when they did that little snip, I was like, hey, that was a lie. I don't like <laughs> So it really feels like a little kid is punching you in your tit. So, okay. Wow. Anyway, and then they do that little sample and they send that away to see what the count, what, what is it that they're actually looking at so that they can determine whether or not if it's actually cancer um, or is it, you know, benign. And so mines turn out to be malignant, which means that they actually see the cancer cells in the, in the, um, in the test. So, so, okay. So then the next two weeks after that, we scheduled the surgery and there's really no surgery prep. You know, surgery prep. Is that a pretty, is that a pretty normal time length? You know, like pretty rapid? I'll have to say, that yeah. Seems like, okay. Really? And then, yeah. And then it, it, but it will determine, remember, oh, so, so one of the things that my doctor shared with me is no, the same way no two women are like, no two treatment are like. Gotcha. So it depends what kind of breast cancer you have, mm -hmm. what stage you're in the placement of it, et cetera. Um, and so for me, I literally was told, if, you, if you're going to have breast cancer, this is what you want, and this is the stage you want to catch it in. Gotcha. Stage so, one. Stage one. Right. Um, and it wasn't a rapid growing cancer. It's called um, ductal carcinoma. And it's that means it's in the milk ducts. And so it was confined to my milk duds. It wasn't, it didn't it spread. Wasn't spreading, right. right. So the other thing that they look at during the surgery, the actual lumpectomy, they'll go into your underarm and remove your lymph nodes. So that was also a critical component to determine whether or not the cancer was spreading. And so the lip nodes are, are medically where all the toxins in your body is like a pathway for the toxins in your body. Correct. Go, so they remove those. Right. And so you have a whole lymphatic system mm -hmm. that mimics your circulatory system, but operates very differently. And so, yes, it filters, but your lymph nodes are where the cancer cells, toxins, all the yucky stuff gets filtered like the way your kidney filters. Right. So what they do is they remove your lymph nodes to see if your lymph nodes capture any cancer cells. And if they did, then they know that it's spreading. Got it. So luckily for me, they didn't catch any. Beautiful. Wow. So when you, wow. So what, what's the procedure after that? Like some people have chemotherapy, some people have radiation. Was there, was that right. for you? Was that your case? So for me, for my personal story, I had to have radiation. So they put you two weeks of recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because, you know, I mean, they just took a piece of your boobs. Right. Yeah. And so right. um, after that. And your lymph nodes. And your lymph nodes. <laughs> and so surprisingly, and I didn't know this um, until after, part of that removal, right, when they do that, is kind of when they remove your lymph node. It's like taking an exit ramp off of the highway. And so what happens when they remove an exit ramp? Traffic builds up. Oh, wow. So I started getting incredible swelling in my breast and my arm, and I didn't know what it was. So you're, it's, you're supposed to do um, special exercises to help move that lymphatic um, fluid through your system to keep it moving. So you're supposed to massage your breasts, massage your arm, do the exercises, but you can't walk a lot because your arm moves when you walk. Mm. And if you do that, it's you're just exasperating, you know, the surgery. So you have to stay as still as you can, but still work to move your lymphatic fluids around. So after the that, and that happens for about two or three weeks after the surgery. Um, lymphedema can develop any time after, literally three or four years after, 10 years later, who knows? Um, and lymphedema is? Lymphedema is when your 
lymphatic fluid builds up in one dedicated location gotcha. and then you start getting the swelling, which is no fun. Okay. Right. So two weeks after my, uh, two weeks after my surgery, I had to have the radiation and radiation was so that it could kill the, the cancer cells that may still be developing in my breast. Um, luckily for me, it was six weeks. There are women that when they find the, when they find the lump is so far along that they give them chemotherapy afterward or before they give them radiation and before the surgery oh. so they can help to shrink it. And then they do radiation and then they do a lumpectomy and some of them have to lose their whole breast. And chemotherapy is really severe. It basically, I, and I hate to say it like this, but it kind of cooks you from the inside out, doesn't it? That's, that's the radiation. So you say that's the radiation? Right. So radiation is when they they put you like in a giant microwave. And what okay. they're working to do is kill the cancer cells in your breast so that they don't grow anymore. Um, the chemotherapy is a medication that they can um, put into, that they have to put into your body to kill the cancer cells. And that's way more invasive. And that's actually what makes your hair fall out. And, um, you know, a lot of women have really bad reaction. Their food tastes like metal. Uh, they get a lot of nausea. Um, it's very painful. Some of them have um, pain in their, in their joints. Um, so they have a lot of side effects. Radiation, um, again, it's like a microwave. And so they kind of cooking you from the inside out. Um, and what I walked away with luckily is a, just a tan line on my breasts. Wow. Right. Where other women is, is way more invasive than that. My goodness. So how are you feeling <laughs> mentally at this time? Because I know it takes a toll on you physically. Um, I know I just I have uh, my co-host from my other podcast had just had a double mastectomy. So mm -hmm. she's still going through, you know, treatment. And um, yeah, just how, how, how are you feeling mentally? So mentally for me, um, initially, I was going through it this time last year. I had just started the five year medication that they put me on. And that's called tamoxifen. And it's different for the, the brand and the medication that they put you on after the radiation is different for everybody um, and depending on your menopausal state. Either way, they have side effects. And my side effects included depression. Mm. But because I don't take medicine and I haven't ever had to take medicine, I was very a. a I guess, a stew about what was happening to me. And so I went back to my doctor and I was so the medication basically left me feeling very depressed. And because I, I'm not one to take medication, I was able to have that conversation with my doctor. And what they ended up doing was reducing the, the milligram, the dosage. Um, and so they transferred me out to another medication. But right now, to be honest, I'm also seeing a therapist. Yeah. So um, was it a combination you think of the medicine and the way you were feeling about taking the medicine that made you depressed too? Um, I want to say that like everything happened so fast initially mm -hmm. for me. And even when I sat down with my surgeon and had that initial conversation about, about what, what, what was going to be happening. I don't think I had time to really process what was happening. Mm. And so when radiation was finished and then, you know, they tell you, oh, it's a pill for five years. And, you know, and, and then I said, I think that's when everything kind of hit. Yeah. You know, on, in addition to the side effects and the medication and things like that. What kept you going? <sighs> Always my kids, right? 
Um, That's why you said you're a mom first. I'm always. <laughs> always. That's exactly why. Mm -hmm. And um, and to you know, to be honest, my life pre cancer is all like community organizing, always involved in politics, always involved in community, always organizing, always involved in another group, and so. Somebody has shared with me, listen, God, this was no mistake. God picked you on purpose. This is your purpose. You know, and nobody, and at four foot 11, nobody has a bigger mouth. Than <laughs> and you met me in person. That's Mark, right. No, I'm little, <laughs> but I'm, the mouth is mighty. So that's right. Listen, I, <laughs> you, you just said it. Listen, sometimes our purpose in life is not clear until something like this happens. And then everything adds up and you look back and you say, damn it. That's what I meant to do. This is what the, that's this, what I was meant to do. I genuinely believe that like God put this in my lap and he put me on a mission. I'm proud to say that since, since this time last year, I had just finished my treatment. I came out of treatment, started a, a partnership with the American Italian Cancer Foundation. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah, and we brought um we brought the mobile mammogram van into Gowanus houses, we brought it into Red Hook houses, we brought it into um Sunset Park, uh, downtown Brooklyn. I'm doing another one by Brooklyn Public Library on November the 13th. I'm doing one at 400 Rockaway Avenue, off of Pickin Avenue on November the 11th for Veterans Day, and so far. To my knowledge, because they've called me to tell me themselves, we found two women that were diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, one of them was stage four metastatic. It's yeah. terrible to hear, but it's also a, a triumph to yeah. find out. And that's, that's what it's about. Right. That's Absolutely. And so you can take measures now and, you know, hopefully be on your way to, to something better. Exactly. So right on for that. So what is your what is your mobile unit consist of? Uh, First thing that has to happen is they have to pre qualify. Yeah. So they have to be age appropriate. They can't be pregnant, and they can't have implants. That's the most important thing. They have to be at least forty years old, um, and they can't have had a mammogram within the last year. That is so important. They don't have to have. Um, they don't have to be a, a legal citizen. They don't have to have health insurance. The organization, American Italian Cancer Foundation, will screen any woman as long as they meet those initial criteria. And they can't have any symptoms because this is just a screening. Screening. Okay. And that's right? important. That's important notice. So they, yeah. some women come and they say, oh, I have this pain or I have discharge or I feel a lump. They won't take you. So you can't have any of those symptoms. Um, again, you can't be pregnant. And you can't have um, you can't have um, implants. So that's the first part. Then when they show up, we'll schedule an appointment for them. The whole thing takes about fifteen minutes, twenty minutes tops, because you have to go through an interview, you have to go see a nurse, and then you actually do the mammogram. The mammogram takes roughly about five minutes. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Is it important? Yes. Will you hurt later? Yes. You know, kind of like a little kid kind of maybe hit you in your titty. Mm -hmm. But we'll know from there what your journey is going to look like. Absolutely. And your journey might mean, right, that you come back a year later because they didn't even find anything. Right. And it goes back to what you just said. It's important. Yeah. It's important. That's the bottom line. It's, so it's important. Be a, yeah. So it's going to be a little bit of discomfort, but compared to the stuff that I went through and compared to the stuff that women at stage two, three, and four are going through, it's literally like a pinch. You right. Know? And it's important what you said. It's a screening. It's we are trying to do preventive measures. Right. So you don't go to stage three and four. You're trying to catch it in advance. Or if you see something that's malignant right away, you know, let's stop it. Let's get, let's take, give the attention to that and fix it right away. Right. That's where we're trying to, it's preventive medicine that right. keeps us alive and healthy. And, know, and I'm excited. 
I'm excited for these women because they overcome a big hurdle. It's scary. It's scary. Huge. Huge you hurdle. Know? For me, I, I, I kind of got caught off guard because I was like, oh, this is my physical, you know, where these women are lining up and they're really, for me, they are incredibly brave. They are really, you know, taking a leap of faith and, and facing their fears. So when they come off the bus, when I host an event, we play music, we take pictures, I have a photo booth. I have a cheerleading squad. We celebrate them. It's. I love that. It's, I love that. And you're not going to get that at the hospital. Right. Not, your doctor's not going to do that for you. They're going to say, thank you. Come again. You right. know, we'll see you for <laughs> your next appointment. Right. But we celebrate them. And you're there with other women who are doing the same thing. You're, you, there's unity in it. Exactly. Make it a unified event. Why, why wouldn't you? Exactly. Yeah. So it's a good time. I, I try to make sure that they have a good time and, um, they feel good about it. I actually had a woman tell me if I would have known it was going to be this much fun, I would have waited. <laughs> she brought her mom to get hers, and she was like, "Yeah, I would have, I, I would have waited. This is this is great, you know." And so I, we share it. You're absolutely right, and I love that because there is a lot of fear in that. There's a lot of fear in going to check. There's a lot of fear in us going to the doctor in general. You know, and if this is a big, you know, uh, uh, killer or a big component of our lives, people of color, we need to take care of it. Now, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention some statistics here. From the cancer.org, uh, uh, 2022, 1.9 million new cancer, I'm sorry, will, cases, 1.9 million new cases will be in 2022. 609,000 will end in fatalities. This is what we don't want. Right. We're trying to do preventive measures to get this taken care of. One in two women and one in three men will develop cancer in a lifetime. That's cancer in general. Not, you know, there are, there's a small number of men, 2,000 men will be diagnosed with breast cancer. That's right. So men, I'm saying this to you too. Let's get out there. Let's make sure everything's healthy. Right. And for right? the men, um, not that their symptoms are different per se, but if a man has a rash that won't go away. If he has any nipple discharge, if he feels a lump from his nipple in his pecs into his underarm and up to his elbow, he should be checking as well. Yeah, any yeah. of those symptoms can be signs for, um, for breast cancer. And for women, um, they also need to know that even after the treatment, and this is the ongoing situation for me, um, even after your treatment, you breast cancer can come back in different places. And that's an important factor. It can come back in your in your lungs, your brain, your neck, or your liver. And so we're constantly with our guard up. So for me, when they say, oh, you're a survivor, I'm not a survivor. We, you know, I had a friend ask me, when will we know that the cancer is gone? And I said, when I die of natural causes, you know, because yeah. it could always come back. Absolutely. Where are you now with everything? How are you? How are you now? Now I feel, you know, I feel fine. I pay attention more to my body. I'm going to the doctor, uh, <laughs> you know, and um, I send a lot of questions. I'm actually 52, so, you know, I feel a little different. I get tired. I don't know if it's COVID or radiation effects long term, but I definitely get tired. I'm I have, I've always had insomnia. And so it's really difficult for me to now, after treatment, navigate and getting accustomed to this new me. New you. Yeah. 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 You know, so it's Melissa 2.0. I have to slow down a little bit. I have to take care of myself a lot more. I'm drinking a lot more water. I'm eating a lot more healthier. I'm taking vitamins. Um, I work to say no more often than I say yes. 
when people ask me to volunteer and, you know, do them favors, um, I'm definitely working to put myself first. So that's different okay. and very new. And they say that uh, some of the preventive measures are, are just that. It's less stress. It's eating healthier. Uh, forget the smoking. Forget the alcohol. You, yeah. know, you don't have to stop living, but you, know, you just reduce some of those things and take care of yourself right. a little better physically and mentally. Right. I also now have a an inversion table. Um, so if any of you guys ever saw that, that's where you, it's one of those platform things that put you upside down. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do it every day for up to five minutes. And that's to help stimulate your blood flow, your lymphatic system, mm -hmm. your brain flow through your brain. Like we don't realize how much we're not doing until we start doing stuff. Right. So yeah. even walking, riding your bicycle, exercise. Um, and something I want to share with women, I love a margarita. Um big I never my, what's what's a margarita gonna do? It turns out that drinking three alcoholic drinks a week can increase your breast cancer your your chances of uh stimulating the cancer cells and 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 having breast cancer develop interesting you say that because just reading the information you know like i said from the cancer.org i was reading some stuff like that too so even just as a male i said wow you know i work in a bar my nine to five is in a bar and maybe i'll have a drink it seems like maybe every day because i'm there Right. That's going to stop because I too am a man of a certain age. So right. I have to take a little bit better care of myself, you know, physically and mentally as well. So I think that, uh, yeah, we just have to do it. We have to do it. And you don't realize that you're not exercising the same way as you were when you were 20. Right. You know, you're not taking care of yourself. So we do, we do have to, we do have to take a look at that Absolutely. as we get a little bit older. And then, um, and I also want to add, like, for me, I'm, as much as I'm focusing on these women, you know, on women coming to get their screenings, I'm also working to provide a support system for women after the fact, um, when they get diagnosed. I want to be able to refer them to these organizations that help them and that are there for us, uh, specifically women of color. The Susan Coleman organization is phenomenal, is great, but we all know that we are not the poster child for Susan Coleman. Right. Yeah, not the we initially before Black Lives Matter, we were not the target audience for Susan Coleman. Right. Um, and we fell into a really small vacuum. But there are organizations out there for women of color, like the Tiger Lily Foundation, which I'm an angel advocate for. Um so we partner and we walk women through the process like we did here today. We also have uh, another really great organization that I found on social media called For the Breast of Us, um, which is an LLC. They're not a nonprofit, but they're doing the work. They're doing yeah. the work and they are promoting women of color to be seen in breast cancer advertisement and awareness, much like you saw Mary J. Blige during the football uh, Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. That's what she was promoting. We have to go get that screening. Right. She had family members to die to breast cancer. And um, speaking of which, luckily for I got diagnosed stage one. After I got diagnosed, two of my cousins got diagnosed. You know, so that's something I'm also promoting, by the way, is that we go and we get our hair done together, our nails done together. We go to the spa together. We have play dates. We have make dinner dates. Let's make a mama round date. I love it. I'm glad that you said that. I love that. Yeah. You know, and men too. It's important. Come and yeah. support us after. Pick yeah, up of course. After and we'll go out on a date. That's right. And men make a whole yeah. event. Make a whole night of it. And yeah. men can check us out, you know? That's right. There you go. See? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Feel around. Get That's to right. <laughs> That's, amen. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. good. Well, listen, I want to say thank you for sharing your story. I want to say thank you for empowering women. I want to say thank you for doing the work that you do for the people, for the culture, for everyone. Thank 
And I want you to let us know how we can get in touch with you and remind us again where the events coming up will be, the couple of events you have. Sure. So the grassroots movement that I'm starting is called Ready, Set, October. It's a year-round endeavor. Um, it's going to include everything from being at the mermaid parade as mammogram mermaids for mammograms at the sand sculpting contest um in august next year we're going to be doing um breast cancer awareness for dogs pink paws project wow um i have because they ironically i fostered a dog and when i got diagnosed she was coming out of her lumpectomy Wow. So wow. her name is Irma. So she got breast cancer too. So I, I was like, okay, fine. Okay, God, I hear you. You know, what are the chances? So we're doing that. Um the mammogram, uh, the next mobile mammogram event is going to be on November the eleventh at four hundred Rockaway Avenue in partnership with city council member Darlene Mealy. If anybody wants to get a mammogram, they can email me at readysetoctober at gmail.com. And it's spelled proper, ready, set, October. And then um, the next one after that is going to be on November the 13th, Sunday, on the Eastern Parkway side of the Brooklyn Public Library at Grand Army Plaza. Okay. And there you have it. You might see me there. I might be doing a little live. Maybe I'll come up there and do a live podcast. Uh, for and you, yes, of course, we'll see. Yeah, Carol, of course, right. yeah, you yeah. Know, so there you go. So, maybe we can do that. Yes. So, I want to thank you, everyone, in the sound of my voice, listening to this episode. Please make sure you share this episode. We need to get this information out there, and please help Melissa in her endeavors. Anybody wants to do a collaboration with her, I'm sure she's open to that. I am totally. Thank you. So, let's do it. If you are a model, if you've had cancer, you want to help out in any way please 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 all the notes all the information will be in the notes go ahead yeah i also want to just put one more message out there so i'm also a united states veteran and i'm partnering with veterans to donate their jackets to breast cancer survivors so that we can embellish them and customize them for survivors and on the back it will be labeled with my logo as either English or Spanish Gehera or warrior because no soldier leaves a warrior behind. So if you have a veteran in your family that wants to donate their camouflage BDU uniform jacket, their fatigues, please give me a call. I'm your girl. We're going to repurpose them and we're going to continue with that mission. No soldier to leave a warrior behind. I love that. Thank you. Listen to the warrior right here. I I dropped the mic after that. Thank, Thank you. you very much for coming on. And like I said, I'll, hopefully I'll come up and I'll you know see you at the at the uh, location up at the Eastern Parkway. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Please come back anytime, everyone. This is one Mike Knight. Please follow the show. All the information for this episode will be in the notes of this uh, podcast. My name is Marcos Luis. You can follow me at Marcos Luis, M-A-R-C-O-S-L-U-I-S. Follow the show at One Mike Night. Join the YouTube live chat, 8 p.m. every Thursday. And also make sure you take a listen to the other podcast, One Mike Night Talk with my co-host, Stephan Anthony Beasley, where we talk about real topics that inspire your life. Also on the One Mike Night channel. And coming up soon, One Mike Night TV. A lot of things coming up. But we'll wow. see you soon. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on this episode of One Mike Night. I'm out. Thank you. Thank you.